Matt Miller, and I'm a lead mentor for Blue Startups. We call our industry is actually payments. So finance is traditionally kind of, you know, traders to Goldman Sachs of the world is, is finance. And we don't really do that side of it, although that's what kind of I was somewhat studied um, in my MBA and focused on that. And so payment sits between technology and banking, I think is the best way to put it. So we like to think of ourselves as a technology company. I don't know if that, you know, we're, we, we try to achieve that role, but we're also somewhat in the banking and have kind of a regulation environment that's associated with that. So it's this interesting component. So the industry we call payments and that's everything from like the credit card networks who I've worked for, but also the squares and the stripes of the world, which are part of that excitement for PayPal of the world um, to go. And what I think is interesting about that as an industry is one that does straddle those two worlds of technology and, and finance uh, or banking, you know, put it that way. But it also, especially in this, this space where I've been, where it's been on like the innovation side, is I've had the opportunity to then work with like almost every industry because everybody needs to get paid or pay someone or both in most cases. Um, so when you're coming up with creative things to do, you get to work with everybody from Apple and Facebook on one side to General Motors on another side to solar panel manufacturers in Sub-Saharan Africa. Because at some point in time, someone pays somebody somewhere in that flow. I think it's been a really interesting time for innovation because you know, in my, I think, relatively short career, it was in the early stages really about like these exciting new technologies that were on the horizon. And so it was, oh, AR, VR, wearables, or whatever that, that tech was. And that was, that was the next big thing. Um, and so we had this sort of, let's say through the, the mid to the mid 20 teens, we had this sort of like next technology mentality. Um, but sort of as we came close to the to 2020, which we've seen is an interesting time. Um, We've got less, there, there isn't that like next big tech on the horizon, like AR is still kind of hanging out there, but never really delivered what it was supposed to deliver. AI has, you know, I don't know, I think AI is interesting because it feels like it was the same, that was big data five, six years earlier. So it's like just kind of this evolutionary thing. It's not really had this life-changing effect that it was supposed to. And so now it's like, what is this one of the things in the last year, a couple of years, what is that next thing that everybody's excited about? And it's not, it's not a thing anymore. Um, it's just change in general. So that's been an interesting opportunity to think about how change happens and how process happens. Uh, and I think the part that I like probably the, the most about it is when pieces just come together seamlessly to work when you don't have to think about technology. And that's when technology is, is at its best. And sometimes in many ways, that's also the hardest sort of things to execute on when you just don't have to think about it. And two-factor authentication occurs, so it's very secure, but you don't even think about the two-factor authentication. It just pops up on your other device, you type in your pin and you're good to go. Those are the type of like, to me, exciting innovations when the actual technology disappears and it just makes life easier. We moved here. It was really a matter of trying to to connect with the local technology community. Uh, getting my background, working with a lot of big tech companies, working within Mastercard, um, as well as this kind of desire to just engage um, with how we can you know make Hawaii a, a stronger market and opportunity for that. Um, I reached out and said, "Hey, I'm here. Would love to do a talk. See if there's an opportunity to do so." I also work pretty closely. Mastercard has its own accelerator it's it's not quite in the traditional model it doesn't provide funding it's really more about accelerating companies into the payments ecosystem so it's facilitating introductions to banks and exposure um, but i'd worked with several of, of mastercard's accelerator companies and worked pretty closely with our uh, accelerator team so had that experience evaluating um, different you know startups as well as evaluating them from an innovation perspective and even an acquisition perspective uh, so was able to to bring that to the table and met with a great group of people and it's been fun to to see what sort of companies uh, are interested in startup paradise so this is my second we're doing the interview process for my second cohort as a lead mentor i was just a, a normal mentor the first time around um, which was a great way to get exposed to the program learn a little bit about it um, but certainly the the lead mentor experience really being able to pair up with a company uh, has been good 
um, there is sort of a natural fit with the, we can always, it doesn't seem too often that there's a lead mentor who like doesn't fit with the company. Uh, and so I got to work with uh, a company that was really focused around sort of conversational chat interfaces. I just spent the last two years as vice president of conversational commerce. So it's just a natural fit. And I was like, yeah, this is what I've been talking about, thinking about talking, you know, working on it for the last year and a half at the industry level. Um, so it was a great company to work with um, and they're really doing well. So it's, it's great to see all the progress that they've made. Yeah, I think the one thing that I, and I think we all sort of as the lead mentors have our own little kind of things that we, we get stuck on. Um, I don't wanna say stuck on, but things that we, we bring perspective on. And for mine, it, it tends to be looking on the, the product side of things and trying to simplify and, and focus a roadmap. Um, so I think there's the overarching business focus, but for a lot of the companies that come in at the stage that they're at, at Blue, they have a bunch of different ways that they could pivot from the, specifically from the product and the feature side. Um, and helping coach through that sort of like, you could be a phone system, but is that where your opportunity is? Is that what you're doing? I think also companies at that growth stage can end up being very, have their roadmap driven by the sales team, um, which for some companies that does work, but you kind of end up being more of a consulting boutique product if you do that. If you let you know each sale, the sales guy comes in and says, if you build this feature, I can make this sale. And then another one comes in and says, if you build this feature, I can make that sale. Um, and you don't end up having you know strategy and you end up creating kind of bespoke units for each one of your, your key clients moving forward. Um, so just creating structure around that and being conscious about your product roadmap is an area where I think it's been the key to focus and, and then really doubling down on what are the things that, that make it unique, right? Rather than going wide on your product feature set, like focus on what that MVP is, what are your customers responding to the MVP, and then execute really, really well on those things before you start branching out. Truly kind of family driven. Um, at the time I was actually doing a lot of, I was living in New York, but doing a lot of work in Asia at the time. Um, so I was flying back and forth almost every other week to Japan or, or China. Um, so that was, that was fun. And then, uh, yeah, it was really just my, my wife's career brought us here. But because of the nature of having uh, a global job, it didn't really matter. My boss was in Miami. Her boss was in London. I had employees in New York, Dublin, and Shanghai. Um, so... You know, I actually just, I filled out the globe, right? So we had East Coast, we had six hours ahead in Europe, we had six hours ahead in China, and then six hours ahead uh, for me in Hawaii. So we actually had perfect sort of six hour follow the suns. Uh, and then I actually increased my global team and had people in Dubai and, and other markets as we went through there. Um, so it doesn't really matter as long as you're willing to get on a plane and get on a phone call at interesting times. And certainly I think technology like Video chat makes all that easier too. Mm -hmm.